So um, the first half of this is probably something that I'm going to find interesting. Possibly Brian and Patrice will. And I expect <laughs> everyone else to be going, what on earth? What on earth? The second half, I'm hoping that everyone will find interesting. But let's just you know, think of it as kind of penance for having a lovely lunch. Um, so John Gaskin, the noted philosopher of religion, prefaces his collection of ghost stories, The Dark Companion, with these words. Why do I, a sceptical academic mm. philosopher, write ghost stories? I suppose it's because I enjoy in a certain way, the cloistered and cosy chill, which is to be found in following out the consequences of possible evil, the consistent ambiguities in things, the worlds we can unlock with our own feelings, or the unnoticed coincidences between death and beautiful teeth, perhaps. Now, leaving beautiful teeth to one side, you'll have to read Gaskin's story, Cropsey's Hole, to discover more. This paper, in part, explores Gaskin's question. Why, in our increasingly scientific and technocratic age, is there a continuing love of ghosts and the paranormal? This paper also aims to address an oversight in a recent article where I claimed philosophers did not show much interest in ghosts or hauntings unless to use them metaphorically or as outlandish examples for broader critiques. As is often the way, post-publication, I realise this hasn't always been the case. Though in fairness, those philosophers who have addressed such experiences as forms of evidence for post-mortem existence have generally been shunted into a dark corner of the profession and viewed as slightly nutty uncles <laughs> whose excesses are to be indulged with a wink and a smile, as John Hales colourfully puts it. What follows is as much a mere culpa as an investigation of why exploring ghosts, something immensely enjoyable, let's all be honest, should be considered a serious pursuit for the philosopher rather than an eccentric aberration. So, the philosopher as parapsychologist. Um, contemporary philosophers influenced by the continental tradition have by no means dispensed with the figure of the ghost. In Jacques Derrida's Hauntology, the ghost is employed to explore that which haunts the text and is present in absences and exclusions. For those accustomed to think of ghosts as apparitions of the dead, this metaphorical usage probably doesn't capture what they assume a philosophy of ghosts to involve. Now, this, I think, is what makes H.H. H. Price's approach to this theme particularly interesting. Wickham Professor of Logic at Oxford from 1935 to 1959, Price was sufficiently interested in parapsychology and the paranormal to hold the presidency of the Society for Psychical Research from 1939 to 1941, and then again from 1960 to 1961. His writings on parapsychology and the paranormal suggest a far neater fit with the common perception of what ghosts are than that proffered by Derrida and his followers. As podcaster Danny Robbins asks portentously at the beginning of each episode of his Uncanny, do you believe in ghosts? Are you a member of Team Skeptic or Team Believer? Price, with Robbins, would readily concur that what matters is considering the strength of evidence for or against the proposition ghosts exist. Price's practice as a logician, I love that word, I work with somebody who's called, who is a logician, George, Sounds like a magician, doesn't it? Let's be honest. Price's practice as a logician and his commitment to empiricism, I am really just an old-fashioned British empiricist, he claimed, frames his approach. His concern is with the evidence that might be assembled from paranormal events. 
Price's interest reflects his times. Born in 1899, he would no doubt have been aware of the renewed interest in spiritualism in the 1920s, prompted by the cataclysmic events of the Great War, an interest further bolstered by the death toll of the Second World War. And Price isn't the only philosopher who considers parapsychology and the paranormal worthy of serious investigation. C.D. Broad, um, Knightsbridge, Knightsbridge Professor of Moral Philosophy at Cambridge from 1933 to 1953, like Price, held the presidency of the Society for Psychical Research from 1935 to 1936, and then again from 1958 to 1960. That both men, far from marginal figures in the history of British philosophy, should have engaged with themes dismissed by many serious philosophers demands, I think, exploration. For the purposes of this paper, my focus is on Price. As a philosopher of religion, I've long been aware of Price's influential papers on death and immortality, and so it seems fitting for me to start with him. In his Serum Lecture from 1971, entitled Two Conceptions of the Next World, Price compares and contrasts embodied and disembodied forms of post-mortem existence. His emphasis is on what such forms of existence would have to involve. Questions that dominate his, inv his investigation are these. What would it be like to have a quasi-material body? What attributes would the next world as a kind of material world have to have? And conversely, what kind of experiences could a wholly immaterial soul be supposed to have? In answering such questions in this paper, he says that dreams provide a clue. In dreams, he says, we are cut off from sensory stimuli, but this doesn't at all prevent us from having experiences, sometimes vivid and exciting ones. Likewise, we might assume would a disembodied afterlife. Price, in furthering this discussion, tests both theories, embodied versus dis disembodied post-mortem existence, to breaking point. His conclusion, despite having different points, starting points, there's some overlap between these. We are left, he writes, with the conclusion that the next world is neither quite a physical world nor quite a dream world, but betwixt and between. And this leads him to the discomforting suggestion that the belief in life after death is not necessarily a comforting one at all. It could well be like a nightmare, <laughs> only worse, because it would be a nightmare from which one could not wake up. Now, we get a sense of why Price's philosophical interest might be helpfully informed by the work of the parapsychologist. His approach is more than just philosophical thought experiment. It's also a serious attempt to consider what the afterlife would have to involve as a result of conceiving human identity in any particular way. Paranormal experiences might then provide valuable evidence for the nature of a post-mortem existence. Further concern shapes Price's reflections, albeit one that is not systematically pursued. The prevalence of a range of psychic phenomena might be approached as enabling comprehensive theory of the nature of reality. That Price felt compelled to keep his philosophical and parapsychological papers apart accounts for his inability, as his editor says, um, to have fully integrated his two worlds of scholarship into one comprehensive system. I think that's quite important. I'm going to come back to that a little bit. Um, so his editor is, um, I guess his name, Frank Dilly, um, and he says that, you know, unfortunately, there wasn't this opportunity to, to do this. 
and it seems to have been because of this desire to keep the philosophy separate from the parapsychology. Price only published one paper concerned with parapsychology in what we might call a regular philosophical journal, Dilly says, and this was early in his career. Much later in life, he published a book on philosophy of religion, which introduces his views on psychical research more fully. There are tantalising hints of what such a systematic inquiry might entail in his papers on parapsychology. Pierre Price sees the presence of the paranormal as challenging dominant contemporary assumptions about the nature of reality. Crucially, he challenges his readers to think about what such a recalibration of our perception of how things are would mean for daily life. Price suggests some possible implications, which do not always make for comfortable reading. Rather more positively, he opens up the possibility of a reading of the ghost that allows for a renewed sense of wonder and a richer engagement with one's world. And it's that latter theme that I'm going to consider later in the paper. For now, let's just briefly, well, hopefully sort of briefly, um, consider Price's philosophical approach to ghosts and hauntings. Counting for ghostly encounters. So how to account for reports of ghostly encounters? Price addresses a range of phenomena as he develops his approach to this question. He considers telepathy, clairvoyance and mediumship. All of them have a place in his discussion. Price's investigation is framed by his willingness to challenge the dogmatic assertion of the dominant scientific view, which he categorises as claiming mental processes are inseparable from bodily ones. So he sees that as the materialist understanding of uh, science. This foundation stone of philosophical materialism, he says, is taken for granted. And it's that that he's got a beef with. It's not particularly argued for. It's less an evidenced hypothesis, more an assertion of belief. Or as Price puts it, it's acquired the status of an absolute presupposition. <clears throat> now, we shouldn't mistake what Price is saying here. He's not dismissing the findings of biological science, far from it. Um, this is what he says, um, everything the biological sciences have discovered about human nature does on the face of it support the materialistic theory. Price's worry, however, is that, these are his words, the queer and disconcerting facts discovered by psychical researchers, unquote, are too quickly dismissed in the service of restating the materialist status quo. Such counterclaims are, he says, not investigated with sufficient seriousness. For one's theory of reality to be truly secure, it's vital that such cases are explored, for they challenge a too easy adoption of philosophical materialism. Price is troubled by the sneering attitude taken by the materialist to such experiences. The sheer number of people who claim to have had paranormal experiences suggests something worth exploring, and Price wants to find out what that something might be. The precision with which he sets about his inquiry befits the approach of the, logi the, the logician. Get your teeth in, Beverly. He's careful in his conclusions, which are far from simplistic. This is most evident in his investigation of apparitions. His account is built by marshalling the evidence gleaned from a number of interlocking paranormal phenomena. So um, I hope you enjoy my pictures of these. Uh, telepathy, clairvoyance and mediumship. First, telepathy. And this is, I think, most important for him. The possibility that people, sometimes separated by many miles, seem able to communicate without language or technology seems to him a significant piece of evidence to be considered. This possibility of telepathy requires us to 
think again about the structure of human personality. The model that Price seems to favour to explain this possibility is that of the common unconscious, a theme developed by Carl Jung and suggestive of a connection to psychoanalytic theories of the mind. And I thought we'd just have a little aside about Freud and telepathy at this point. Indeed, the overlap between Price's philosophy and psychoanalysis is, I think, intriguing. Freud, like Price, was fascinated by the possibility of telepathic communication. This isn't entirely surprising, given the weight attributed to ideas of transference between the analyst and the analysand that shapes psychoanalytic practices. In the transference, ideas and feelings are communicated in the analytic setting that aren't only revealed in what is explicitly verbalised. And there's a further similarity. Freud's interests in paranormal activities were far from comfortable for some of his more empirically minded admirers, like, for example, the British uh, psychoanalyst. He is a psychoanalyst, is Ernest mm. Jones. Yeah. As Stephen Hales noted at the start of this paper, to investigate the paranormal seems a disreputable pursuit for the serious scientist or philosopher. And Freud provides a good example of this. Writing to Jones, Freud describes taking part in an experiment in telepathy conducted by Sandor Ferenczi and his daughter. Freud feels the need to reassure the more empirically minded Jones. This is Freud's words, my acceptance of telepathy, he writes, like my Judaism and my passion for smoking, are personal quirks, if you like. Stating more than is perhaps the case, Freud continues, the subject of telepathy is not related to psychoanalysis. Now, Price goes further than Freud, for he wishes to consider the implications if telepathic communication does indeed prove possible. If supported by good evidence, such forms of communication, not reliant as they are on physical methods of communication, would significantly undermine the reduction of the personal, of personal identity to the physical body. And with it, materialist claims that when the body dies, the self is annihilated. At this point, mediumship enters the fray. Here is the possibility of communication between the living and the dead. Sorry, the possibility of telepathic communication between the living and the dead, or the possibility of communication between the living and the dead. Price analyzes the evidence to be gleaned from seances. How to account for the accuracy of some communications? He offers two suggestions. The first, that these accurate communications reflect telepathy on the part of the medium. A kind of ESP, if you like, enables the medium to connect to the thoughts of the sitter. But he says this explanation cannot account for all such communications. There are examples where the dead identify the location of objects that are not known even to the sitter, with the result that a further possibility must be entertained. Something is communicating these facts to the medium. Now, I hope we're starting to get a sense of the tentative nature of his conclusions. It's enough for Price that mediumship suggests some evidence that communication is possible between minds and with it the possibility that death might not be the end. And so we come eventually, sorry about that, oops, go back, to hauntings, or as Price terms it, parishions. His use of this word is important for it allows him to combine reflections on appearances of those still living, but in another place, with appearances of those who are dead. So this is from him. The most remarkable fact 
about an apparition, he says, is that it can occur at a distance from the place where the person's physical organism is. Whether his physical organism is alive or dying or dead. Continuity. Talk of ghosts, then, he says, is misleading because it implies that all apparitions are apparitions of the dead and also that all apparitions are haunting apparitions. Now, by haunting apparitions, he means specific places where the same manifestation has been occurred by uh, observed by different people. Now, there are certainly apparitions that appear in the same locality, he says, but he's much less interested in these as they lend themselves to alternative explanations, perhaps the stone tape um, idea. Um, but he's not so much interested in that. What he's really interested in are the way in which apparitions might relate to his overarching interest in the possibility of post-mortem survival. Telepathic communication can be applied to some forms of apparition, but not to others. Perhaps we, what we have in such phenomena is something that looks like a material object. A double is how he puts it. Perhaps that's a projection of how the dead person thinks they look, and thus it's something more like a dream image. Again, he sort of has some tentative thoughts on that. Now, I'm sure this is going to be a moment of great relief to us all. We could go much further into this detailed discussion, um, but let's move on to his conclusions. As I say, these are far from definitive. The most he's prepared to say about the examples of apparitions that he presents is that we seem to have here, in his words, something which is intermediate between the mental and the physical, something which does not quite belong either to the mental or the physical realm, but has properties of both. Now, he's aware of how the sceptic might respond to such a claim, for, as he says, this is certainly a very strange idea. But strange though it is, I think it may possibly be useful. So reading Price, I think, is quite a curious experience for I think he's at his most compelling when he's at his most tentative, that he is uncertain about what, if anything, such phenomena prove opens up space for his readers to think differently. Of mediumship, for example, he asks, what are we to make of these queer happenings? Rather than throw our hands up in despair, rather than rejecting them out of hand, we should instead grapple with them. Again, these are his words. We must try to make something of them. The evidence is too abundant to be ignored. And the same conclusion might well be made in the case of apparitions. For some, the inconclusive nature of his investigations might lead to the dismissal of ghosts and hauntings in the way of many a sceptical philosopher. But let's stick with Price's refusal to do so. To reject such experiences is to fail to think seriously about the nature of reality. You think it's so much about your paper, Patrice. Um, to understand the world better, to consider our place in it, all of the evidence should be reviewed, not just that which supports the dominant materialist way of seeing reality. There might well be evidence, paranormal of evidence, that challenges key tenets of that worldview, notably concerning the possibility of an afterlife. Accepting these conclusions, no matter how tentative, has far-reaching implications, and not just for the theory of reality. It matters to us as individuals, how we frame the world. Perhaps the materialist conception of reality is as much a form of religious belief as the claims of the religious that the materialist is at pains to reject. If there is good evidence, or even just the glimmering of possible evidence for a post-mortem existence, we should think about how to prepare for it. This is very much Price's approach rather than mine. Here's Price expressing this notion and because it's so important to him, I'm going to cite it in full. 
and he writes beautifully. So don't, you know, this is, this is, he is a, an example of how philosophy should write, I think. If there was a chance, let us again put it as low as one out of 50 for the sake of illustration, that one will survive death and will continue to be conscious, to have thoughts and feelings, one will be wise to spend a little time and energy in considering what kind of existence one might have after death, supposing one does survive, and in preparing oneself for that possibility or that danger, if you prefer to look at it so. It has been said that we brought nothing into this world and it's certain that we carry nothing out. With all respect, I venture to disagree with this statement, or at least the second part of it. It seems to me that if there is personal survival, we shall take a good deal with us when we pass out of this world into the next, namely our memories, our desires, our character, and any ESP powers we may have. And the memories and the desires will presumably include those unpleasant or guilty ones which we have repressed in this present life. Indeed, I am afraid that we shall have a very considerable amount of psychological baggage to take with us if we do survive. And we should be wise to take a little trouble while we still can to ensure that it is of a desirable kind, just in case the survival hypothesis should be true. Well, might the ghost elicit fear? Just not quite, Price suggests, in the way we might think. So, for, for not philosophers amongst us, we now look um, into this idea of wonder and the paranormal. Now, we might well be unconvinced by the direction that Price's analysis takes. Much will depend upon the weight we're prepared to give the evidence that he presents, and we may well find it tenacious. tenacious. Price doesn't entirely help us here, um, entertaining the prospect that his argument may be queer or wrong, may be endearing, and he uses those words an awful lot as he goes through this material, you know, we might well wonder whether changing our behaviour in the here and now on the basis of this kind of wager-like argument is necessary. Let's reorientate our gaze. Like Price, I agree that something important is opened up by the fascination with the paranormal. Like Price, I believe entertaining the possibility of ghosts or apparitions allows for a fresh perspective on what matters in life. And where I probably diverge is in thinking less about the implications of ghosts and our fascination with them for the possibility of a post-mortem existence, and more about how these stories encourage us to contemplate anew the richness, the mystery, even the magic of our life here and now. Oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Here the challenge that Price makes to reductionist readings of reality comes to the fore. Ghosts and the stories told about them open up a world all too often closed down when it's believed that everything can be made plain, everything understood by human intelligence and rationality. The ghost encourages us to look beyond surface understandings of the world, enabling us to consider with fresh eyes the world we inhabit. Let's return to John Gaskin, sceptic, philosopher and writer of ghost stories. This combination of interests may seem odd, just as encountering H.H. Price, the psychic investigator, sits rather uncomfortably with the image of H.H. Price, the logic professor. Yet Price is not the only logician interested in ghosts. It's quite interesting to think about that connection, possibly, but I'm going to this, at this stage. It might even be that his interest in analysing such evidence sits well with his determination as a logician not to assume the credibility of any dominant theory, 
in this case materialism, without considering seriously the grounds for and against it. Gaskin's scepticism similarly might be seen as shaping his interest in and love of ghost stories. Consider the words with which Gaskin concludes his introduction to philosophy of religion. In them, he foregrounds the possibilities of scepticism. This is what he says. My mind inclines to the not altogether disagreeable Epicurean acceptance that the world is as it is and is all there is. But the hope of other worlds somehow linger. This is scepticism, not as dogma or unbelief, but as something that sits between belief and unbelief. Space is opened up by the sceptical approach. And an element of Gaskin's stories suggests this in a manner that diverges from the approach of the master teller of ghost stories, excuse me, M.R. James. And I think at first sight there's some considerable overlap between James and Gaskin and the kind of stories that they construct. Like James, academics form a staple element in Gaskin's stories. In James's tales, the sceptic disrupts the confident, sorry, the spectre disrupts the confident certainties which define the world views of his protagonists by breaking the ordinary run of things. Classic example of this is found in uh, James's O Whistle, and I'll come to you, my lad. I'm so sorry. Um, James's central character is Professor Parkins, an academic who confidently knows the nature of reality and strongly rejects any talk of ghosts. Um, this is how Parkins expresses this. I hold that any semblance, any appearance of concession to the view that such things might exist is equivalent to a renunciation of all that I hold sacred. So that's what Parkins claims, very clear statement of philosophical certainty. Confronted with a terrifying spectral presence, slide very ghostly shows that, um, a spectral presence that's elicited by his unwise blowing of an ancient whistle found inauspiciously in a graveyard. The professor's neat and tidy worldview is inevitably undermined. As James Riley comments at the end of his tale, as you may imagine, the professor's views on certain points are less clear cut than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Gaskin's Blair word weary suggests a subtly different framing of the effect the breaking in of the disruptive supernatural has on a worldview. In this ghostly encounter, it's not just that a worldview is disrupted, a new space for a different form of reflection is also created. Um, an academic, Dr. Martindale, spends a break before Christmas at an isolated and nearly empty hotel. He should be at home with his family. But for reasons that become clearer as the tale proceeds, he needs a rest and an escape from my thoughts before facing the rigours of our family Christmas. Mm -hmm. Who can disagree? Mm -hmm. It turns out that his break is not quite as restful as he envisaged, for he is unsettled and troubled by eerie sounds, including the desolate barking of a dog. Dr. Martindale cannot dismiss the reality of what he's experiencing. I know the difference between what I see, he writes, and what is vague or uncertain or of doubtful veracity. I am a critical man. I know myself. And he notes that while the experience was disturbing, it hasn't undermined his scepticism. I am the same sceptic now that I was then, he says. A conversation with the hotel's owner does, does however, change something. Martindale is told of a sad tale of a lost son and a faithful dog. 
it emerges that he is the first person to hear the dog other than his host. Something unites them, something that gives a sense of solace to the hotelier who is the father of the dead son. I've waited half a lifetime, the hotel owner says, for someone who would understand it lightens the load, you know. Now, why the narrator understands only becomes clear in the final sentences with which Gaskin concludes his story. The narrator, too, has lost a son. He may not have shared this sad loss with the hotel's owner, but he does stop on his way home at our family church to put a few winter flowers on the grave of that other little boy whose father had also been too engrossed in his work to go with him when he was lost in the flooded heart hope burn. Space is opened up in his ghostly encounter to acknowledge a loss, to mourn, perhaps even to start out on the road to healing. There's the possibility then that entertaining the presence of the ghost challenges the dull flatness of reductionist materialism and the kind of functionalism that often attends it. In Gaskin's tale, the path of bereavement isn't one that involves moving from A to B in a timely and predictable fashion via the kind of prescribed steps derived from self-help books about the work of bereavement. Something much more hesitant, more difficult, is alluded to in Gaskin's closing sentences. Oh, excuse me. Here, I think, is the possibility offered by ghost stories. The ghost holds out the possibility of a depth to life that goes beyond that which is obviously desirable. To experience life in all its fullness cannot exclude that which is difficult or painful, death or loss or grief. The very richness of life might even be enhanced by those very aspects from which we, like Gaskin's academic, might prefer to hide. A comment Price makes in, in regard to mediumship touches upon this possibility of a more complex, more messy account of human life. Price accepts that the complex weaving of attributes he identifies with, with, with mediumistic knowledge may not feel very satisfactory. However, Price goes on to say, what these phenomena do at least show is that human personality is something much more complex and also, if I may say so, much less neat and tidy than we usually take it to be. And again, of mediumship, Price says, we see writ large displayed in glaring colours, the disunity, the instability, the many levelled character, which is present to some degree in the minds of us all. Now, such an idea shouldn't embarrass us. The possibility of a completely integrated personality is to Price to be resisted. Um, this is how he puts it. It has the same kind of repulsiveness as the idea of a completely integrated or totalitarian society. Such a society would see everything that we call originality and inspiration, these are Price's words, whether intellectual or artistic, vanish from the world. And at the time that he writes these words, uh, they're found in a lecture of his from 1959 that was published in 1966. The horrors perpetuated by Stalinism would have been impossible to ignore the dangers of that kind of totalitarian thinking all too apparent. Messiness makes for creativity. Uh, Price's reflections suggest a mysterious quality to, to being human, which opens up in turn the possibility of a fresh sense of wonder. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, also a member of the Society for Psychical Research, mirrors this sense of richness elicited by that which lies outside the ordinary. 
Concluding his account of the Cottingley fairies, he suggests that entertaining the possibility that fairies exist adds a charm to life that takes us beyond our surface existence. The thought of them, Conan Doyle says, even when unseen, will add a charm to every brook and valley and give romantic interest to every country walk. But more than just an individual benefit, Conan Doyle suggests that there might also be a social benefit to this kind of wonder. Uh, the recognition of their existence, he writes, will jolt the material 20th century mind out of its heavy ruts in the mud and will make it admit that there is a glamour and a mystery to life. Now, of course, we're all sitting here thinking, but these photographs were famous. <laughs> and indeed, given the exposure of these pictures as fakes constructed by the girls involved, we might well not be impressed by Conan Doyle's thoughts. But I think entertaining that possibility that there might be more things in heaven and earth might not just be pleasurable, but might also enable us to look at the world again, resisting ideas that would reduce all experiences to the merely prosaic or the processes of institutions. And this might indeed be the best way to read the fascination with ghosts and hauntings, tales and experiences that can't easily be explained, challenge the temptation to reduce everything to the surface and that which is known. The abiding presence of ghosts encourages us to explore the world and its deeper wonders. And if H.H. Price is right, they might even make us think about ourselves and what we take seriously differently too.